Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you so much for joining ICNC for another webinar in our academic webinar series. We are so excited to have the speakers we have here for you today and to dive into what they have to share. Today's program is entitled Prison Hunger Strikes, How Prisoners Weaponize Their Lives to Win Dignity. This is a very fascinating topic and I cannot wait for what our presenters have for us and also for the discussion that will unfold afterward. You're welcome to follow along on Twitter as well. You can find us at Civil Resistance. You'll see the handles for the authors there too, or you can search or participate in the discussion with hashtag ICNC webinars. This presentation today is coming off of the newly released ICNC Press monograph Prison Hunger Strikes in Palestine, a Strategic Perspective. This started as a proposal from the authors um, into doing a new study, looking at the role and the ways and the history and the strategy and the theory and practice of people who are incarcerated, who want to wield power in what is very uh, constrained conditions. And uh, the study really uncovered a range of options in planning and preparing for this. We saw it as a much needed area of research and it's also something that has culminated in a real bridging between the academic world and the practitioner world. And so as a listener, whether you are an activist, a family member of someone incarcerated, uh, someone in an NGO or a scholar yourself, um, we think that we have something really potent and powerful for you here today. The authors did over 25 interviews, uh, well, in, multiple interviews with over 25 different people, um, the bulk of them being actual uh, hunger strikers themselves, formerly incarcerated or family members of those incarcerated, primarily in Palestine, but also from other countries. This was paired with uh, desk research into hunger strikers uh, of Kurdish, Irish, South African, and British backgrounds to give a really full picture of what this world and this uh, strategic choice looks like. The study itself, which is now available for free download, is um, it covers the political and historical backdrop of prison hunger strikes in Palestine. And so if you are not well adept at, at Palestinian history over the last 60, 70 years, that is supplied for you so you are still able to jump into the theme covers the theory and practice. It deals with questions like, is, is this self-harm? It breaks the binary conceptions of resistance by looking at the idea of the weaponization of life. It compares collective and individual hunger strikes. It looks at the actual process of striking from, from preparations and planning all the way to the negotiations that come at the end stage of a strike. It looks at the idea of repression. What shape does that take within a prison? And how do strikers respond to acts of repression? And then it evaluates the efficacy of hunger striking within uh, Palestinian hunger striking history. And it leaves us with lessons for allies, uh, for the general public, but especially for people who are hunger striking or plan to hunger strike. And so with that said, I'd like to turn it, well, before I turn it over, let me introduce our, our speakers today. We are joined by Malika Mohammed Schweich. She's a Palestinian academic from the Gaza Strip based at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, where she teaches and researches prisons as spaces of power, resistance, and peace building. She's the author of several works at the intersection of prison resistance and power, including Dynamics of Prison Resistance, Hunger Strikes by Palestinian Political Prisoners in Israeli Prisons, Engendering Hunger Strikes, Palestinian Women in Israeli Prisons, and most recently, Prison Periods, Bodily Resistance to Gendered Control. She finds purpose and joy in giving back to the community and being involved in social justice work. Her most recent and ongoing project since 2021 is Freelancers in Gaza with Candice Amani to connect freelancers in Gaza with clients around the world and provide them with tailored mentorship. Our other speaker today and the co-author of the study is Rebecca Ruth Gould, who is the author of numerous works at the intersection of aesthetics and politics, including Writers and Rebels, the Literature of Insurgency in the Caucasus, 
the Persian prison poem, Sovereignty and the Political Imagination, and most recently, Erasing Palestine, Free Speech and Palestinian Freedom. Together with Malika Shweh, she is the author of pa The Palestine Exception to Academic Freedom, intertwined stories from the front lines of UK-based Palestine activism in biography and interdisciplinary quarterly, which brought together their shared interests relating to Palestinian liberation. She is Professor Islamic World and Comparative Literature at the University of Birmingham, where she directs Global Lit Project. We are so happy to have the two of you with us today. I'll turn it over to you now, and um, I look forward to hearing what you have to share. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruce. Uh, it's so lovely to be here. I hope everyone is doing well, enjoying the spring um, light and warmth. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for the ICNC as well for um, their support from day one. It has been a joy to work with all of you, with the team. Um, and I'm also super excited that some of them are with us today. Some of the team uh, that we've worked with are with us today um, to see the project and how it has evolved. Um, so the way that we're going to be doing this is I'm going to be speaking for about 10 to 15 minutes. I'm going to time myself so the timer starts. Um, and then uh, Rebecca is going to be also um, speaking for 10 to 15 minutes. I'm going to be speaking more or less uh, uh, about the personal aspect of, of hunger strikes and how I became involved um, and became interested and committed uh, to uh, the like the issue and the topic of hunger strikes in Palestine, but also in other in other contexts. And then Rebecca is going to be speaking about the transnational aspect uh, of of hunger strikes. Um, so what I'm going to be doing just to make things a little bit more fun and engaging, I'm going to be sharing a screen now with some pictures. Um, so just bear with me for a few seconds while I do that. Okay, that should work. Does that, do you see that, Bruce? Yes, it's coming through great. Amazing, okay. Okay, so I'm going to just put that in here because it's easier. Um, okay, so this is, of course, you know, a work that we've been working on uh, for a few years now. Uh, it involves a lot of interviews, uh, like Bruce men rightly mentioned, it involves multiple interviews with uh, 25 people that we um, have met in different parts of the world. Um, but the focus has been has been Palestine. So uh, prisoners and hunger strikers uh, within Palestine or who are Palestinian and have been deported uh, to other parts of the world. Before I get into the presentation, I think it would be nice uh, just to speak a little bit more about the artwork that you can see uh, on uh, the screen here. And this is an artwork by a Palestinian young artist who is actually a student in her last year of university in Gaza. Her name is Hiba Muhammad. Um, and she, um, she painted uh, this amazing artwork for us of kind of like three uh, little artwork that shows the journey of a hunger striker from hunger strike to freedom, uh, starting from the first kind of picture to my left, which is uh, the prison uniform, that brown uniform with Hebrew words, um, and then that kind of um, you know, like basically that that sign of uh, of 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 not eating, um, which refers to hunger strikes, um, and then the picture in the middle is uh, of solidarity um, and activism happening outside the prison within Palestine, but also outside Palestine to support that prisoner who uh, who is on hunger strike, um, and then the last one is of freedom, um, and that sun that you can see uh, in in the hand of that person. Uh, refers or Hiba understand that as as uh, kind of you know freedom for um, that hunger striker um, or achievement of their demand. 
Okay, um, so I actually got involved in hunger strikes um, activism when I was still in the Gaza Strip. These are pictures from, I don't know, maybe 2011, 2012. Um, and I remember kind of being involved in this salt and water um, activism work uh, where, as you can see here, um, a lot of like really young activists and young students uh, from the Gaza Strip would come together and, you know, talk about what's going on in prison and doing some like little um, protest outside, uh, mostly the ICRC, the International um, Red uh, Cross kind of uh, building in the Gaza Strip. And this is how I became involved and became passionate uh, about the topic of hunger strikes, but also prisons uh, in, in general. Um, and I remember I ended up, you know, doing my, my work, my um, master's and my PhD, uh, on prisons and on hunger strikes. So this is a picture from my Viva uh, in May 2019. Um, and I remember when I had um, when I had my my Viva my scholarship for my PhD, um, kind of like the panel where you have to discuss whether you should have the scholarship or not. Uh, I remember Ilan Pepe here, who was my first. Uh, who was one of the people in the panel, but ended up becoming my first supervisor. He um, he said, but you can't travel to Palestine. It's hard, it's dangerous and all uh, indirectly kind of um, pushing me away from doing uh, field work in Palestine. So it has been hard for me um, as a Palestinian uh, to go and conduct interviews uh, in Palestine. But the flip uh, side of this is the fact that I have been able to travel to other parts of the world um, and meeting with ex-prisoners and hunger strikers uh, who opened my eyes in so many ways to the transnational aspect of, of resistance and solidarity within prisons, um, how prisoners in Ireland, for example, have learned from uh, the Palestinian case, how in 1981, uh, a prisoner uh, or someone from Ireland got in touch with prisoners in, in, in Palestine just to see um, what they have done differently uh, that they can learn from, from them um, about hunger strikes uh, in, in that context. And that was before 1981, which was the major hunger strike that exists in the Irish history, uh, when 10 men, of course, died, uh, the first one of, of whom was uh, Bobby Sands. What I find fascinating about the Irish hunger strike is that uh, within the history of, of Ireland, you will see that um, hunger strikes and fasting um, are so deeply rooted in their culture and religion and history back in the day thousands of years ago when someone does injustice against someone, uh, that someone is going to fast uh, against their door um, until uh, justice uh, prevails for them. Um, and of course, allowing this person to die um, in front of that person's uh, door is, is a shame in so many ways. Um, and and they, they would try their best not to let them die uh, because of the shame attached to it. But still the Irish uh, person uh, and the Irish community think that it's so important to consult with the Palestinian um, hunger strikers because of how much achievement um, and how much they have achieved uh, in so many ways uh, in, in the last, um, since 1968, which is um, the kind of like the year that we trace the first um, hunger strike to since uh, the occupation of Palestine. Um, some of the first hunger strikers or some of the first people that I actually got to know uh, about their hunger strikes in Palestine were these two uh, pictured here in the screen. The first one of, of whom on the right uh, is Khadr Adnan. Um, and the second is Hana Shalabi, both of whom actually started individual hunger strikes around 2011, 2012. Um, and they were kind of like leader and pioneers uh, or pioneers in, in actually leading individual hunger strikes around that time. Uh, even though there have been other individual hunger strikes before, uh, but their action around that time actually led into hundreds and hundreds of individual hunger strikes uh, within the Palestinian context. Um, and of course, I find myself, you know, trying to do as much as I can um, to write uh, about their their um, their action. Um, and of course, as I said before, ended up doing my master's and PhD uh, on the topic of hunger strikes. 
One other person that actually um, also went uh, or embarked on hunger strike in around 2013 was Samir Isawi, who ended up becoming the longest surviving hunger striker in the Palestinian history. And it, I'm trying to see the time, I'm good. Um, he, so also uh, Samir Isawi was one of those uh, prisoners who actually impact, had an impact on me um, to um, kind of embark on this journey uh, of, of writing about hunger strikes and, and prisoners. I'm more than happy to expand on his case as well in the question and answer session. Uh, but it has been super interesting to see how much support Samir has got and how that support not only helped him or support him in his action, but support other prisoners around him in, in Israeli prisons, Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prisons, but also prisoners around the world. We did use a lot of conceptions and I'm going to try to make sure that these concepts that I'm going to uh, explain are as accessible as possible uh, for all of us, uh, given that um, we th the attendees are coming from different backgrounds and not all of us ac are academic. Uh, but one of the main concepts that we uh, kind of focus on in our book is that hunger strike is not only about bodies, uh, but also about souls. And this is why you see that sometimes prisoners go for hunger strike even though their bodies are weak enough and fragile enough and vulnerable enough. So there is the importance of soul that is so um, central to the, um, to the action of hunger strike. But the other thing is dignity. Uh, prisoners that we interviewed and people more generally that we interviewed in Palestine and outside Palestine um, have centered the importance of dignity uh, for, for their action, um, that it's dignity or or, or death. Um, and, and this is why they have taken this kind of lost resort action so that they can regain dignity. But the other thing is agency, agency over their body. Um, and this is something that, um, that is, like I've mentioned before, it's, it's the lost resort because they've tried everything that they can within the prison context. Um, and, and everything has failed them. Um, so they have no other choice but to use their body um, so that they can make a statement and regain this agency and regain this control uh, over their body and their life. Um, and this is the opposite of, of necro, necro politics uh, of Mpambe, uh, one of the scholars that exists within academia, but the opposite of, it, of this is, is necro resistance. So just kind of unpack both of these concept, concept, concepts. Uh, so necro, necro politics is more or less about the state or the government or um, a controlling body having control over your life and your death. Uh, necro resistance is the opposite of this, uh, and it means that you actually take control over your body and over your life and over your death. Um, so through hunger strike, prisoners take control over their life and over their death when they decide that they're not gonna go um, and eat or drink. Um, and this in a way is a statement, a political statement saying that I actually can take control over when I can die and when I can live. Um, we also use the concept of weaponization of lives, uh, which is um, a concept used uh, first by um, scholar uh, Bano Bergo. Um, by this, by saying that the prisoner weaponized their lives, uh, we're actually pushing against the binary of violence and nonviolent resistance, nonviolent resistance, uh, which we think is dehumanizing, and we can expand on this a little bit more as well in the question and answer session. But the other thing that we think about why, why we actually push against the binary of violent and nonviolent resistance um, is that this is the choice of the prisoner and the, inter the, the interviewees that we um, that when we have that discussion with them and ask them how we how you would actually conceptualize the action of hunger strike, um, they push against violent and nonviolent resistance tactics um, as a conception for their action. And finally, um, you know, prison resistance and solidarity travel uh, around the world. Um, it's very interesting to see through this project and other projects that Rebecca and I are working on um, how um, 
prison solidarity and resistance um, are not confined um, to one particular region, uh, but they are transnational, transnational and international. And I'm gonna just end with the story, uh, or before I end with the story, it's this picture here in the middle is a picture of Palestinian women going for uh, a protest and saying here in the border that you can see Nafha, which is an Israeli prison in the south of, of uh, in the south of the country, and then H Block, which is uh, a prison in Ireland, um, and then they say one struggle. I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is a picture. Uh, just after the death of Bobby Sands um, and Palestinian women uh, came in the street to um, kind of protest his death, his death, but also to send a, a solidarity message um, to, to the people of, of Ireland um, around that time. Um, and of course, I'm happy also to expand on the South African uh, Palestinian connection. Um, as you can see here, the, the picture of Nelson Mandela and his uh, autobiography that has been uh, smuggled out of the prison by another prisoner and how that autobiography as well has been read by other prisoners around the world, um, but more specifically Marwan Barghouti, who is a Palestinian prisoner. But just to end with the story of Angela Davis in the, in I think it was early 1970s, maybe 1970 or 1971, Angela Davis, uh, this American civil rights, uh, African-American civil rights um, activist who received uh, a letter um, around that time from Palestinian prisoner in Nafha prison that I've just mentioned here, uh, which is in the south of the country. Um, Angela Davis, that letter um, was written on a scrap of paper signed uh, by uh, a good number of prisoner, Palestinian prisoner. It was smuggled out of Nafha prison by someone. Another person smuggled that letter from outside the prison to the United States. And then a third person smuggled that letter from, out from the United States uh, to um, inside Angela Davis um, prison cell. A few years ago, Angela Davis visited Palestine and more specifically Jerusalem um, with a group of um, with a group of indigenous women and black women uh, from the United States. Then he she she was talking about meeting. Uh, an old man who approached her and said that I remember or I've heard that you've um, that you've received a letter in the 70s from uh, Palestinian prisoners uh, who showed sub shared support and showed uh, solidarity with you and she said yes and the man said I was one of those who actually signed that letter and when she was speaking about this she was saying how overwhelming uh, or how you know, happy she is uh, that actually both of them are still um, supportive of the of, of, of prison um, kind of like struggle for justice. Um, and it's it's inspiring in so many ways um, to see how these letters are not only meaningless kind of uh, papers, but they actually, you know, um, yeah, raise the morale of of the prisoners um, when the prison, as a as a uh, as a structure, is there to cut prisoners from the rest of the world, um, and kind of tell them directly or indirectly that there is no one that actually care about you. But then you have those letters being smuggled and traveling um, to inside your prison cell to tell you that people are actually thinking about you. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca now? Yes. Um, oh, okay. An automatic question to me. Wonderful. So yes, Malika, thank you so much. That was, that was, I think, a wonderful um, summary of, of our book. And I also just want to say, yeah, thank Bruce and uh, Steve and the whole ICNC team for, for the many years of support that uh, went into the creation of this, this monograph. And also specifically Malika, so I've learned so much from you. Um, I think you're an inspiration to, to everyone. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'm just going to kind of step back a little bit um, from Malika's examples and um, reflect a little bit on the sort of the transnational dimensions, which I think she already underscored, especially um, with her final story, uh, but the transnational dimensions of hunger striking. And that and, uh, I'll just also say that I think that was one thing that, that really impressed me um, given that, you know, based, Drina, are you, 
years of research into the topic uh, because if you think about the the physical position of prisoners, you know that the the sort of um, from a material perspective, the lack of agency they have by definition, their freedom is constrained, and yet their their acts um, in the context of hunger striking have this ability to traverse international borders in a really amazing way. Um, and um, yeah, another feature I think that maybe might be worth sort of just, just mentioning too um, is what all of the examples, which I'll sort of briefly uh, run through in a second, um, in addition to, to the sort of similarities you can see among the different um, types of hunger striking in different contexts, you could also see a similarity of the state's response. And I think you can learn a lot about the carceral state uh, from a comparative study of hunger striking in different geographies. And also, um, I think it is worth mentioning that this is probably, you know, there are quite a few um, studies, scholarship on hunger striking from specific geographies, uh, probably each of the geographies we look at, uh, there's some sort of resource that talks about hunger striking in those contexts, but truly comparative studies are, are rare. And we believe this is probably the, the most, the first uh, really systematic attempt to, to look at hunger striking and all of its global manifestations. So as, as Malika mentioned, um, actually, you know, the practice of hunger striking has a kind of continuity with even medieval practices in Ireland. Um, as Malika, Malika did mention this example, uh, that there was the, the legal code of medieval Ireland um, specified that as a kind of uh, penance for for, for crime or asking for forgiveness, um, the, or, or if, if someone is demanding something from a from um, someone who they think is there uh, has persecuted them, they they can go on a hunger strike, and it's a it's a way of kind of making a political assertion. So that was part of the the political structure of medieval Ireland. It was very much embedded in the culture. Um, and moving forward, you know, several centuries in early um, 20th century Britain, of course, uh, the suffragettes um, made hunger striking, put that puts hunger striking really at the center of their political praxis. And you can see continuities also again in the response uh, of the state because many of, uh, with, with contemporary times, because many of these suffragettes were subjected to force feeding, just as say you find in Guantanamo Bay, um, prisoners who went on hunger strike were subjected to force feeding, which we discuss um, that in the monograph. Um, it's, it's important to note that that that's, can actually be a very dangerous practice. I mean, it can be very uh, permanently damage the internal organs of prisoners uh, when they're forced, when, when tubes are placed inside of, inside of them and the, some kind of um, liquid or food is, is forcibly injured their body, that that's dangerous. But, but because uh, um, apparently um, the prisoner uh, agents uh, are, are threatened by hunger strikes, they, they feel like that's a risk worth taking often in many contexts. So particularly in um, Palestine, is, uh, Israeli prisons and in Guantanamo Bay, that's, and that's really well documented. Um, and yeah, so just so you could sort of draw a line um, going from Ireland and, and throughout history for centuries, to the British suffragettes, to Pal uh, Palestine, as Malika mentioned in detail, and there was, I think, a mutual reciprocity of, of influence in terms of the hunger striking that was taking place during the 1980s um, in those geographies to South Africa, um, to the Kurds in Turkey, and that's that's the subject of uh, Banu uh, Bargu's ma a monograph, and to Iran also, that's, that's um, I think, a uh, area, um, hunger striking in Iran, uh, we, we talk a little bit about, you know, not, not in um, extensive detail, but that's one area that really deserves quite a bit of attention. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, uh, to Guantanamo Bay. Um, so that, 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 that shows that there's, um, it's a, hunger striking is a way of communicating, that prisoners have for communicating across the world with each other, and also most particularly, I think, um, with the world itself. So one thing that often accompanies hunger strikes, which we analyze um, in, in the monograph in detail, are letters, letters to the world, right? There are often these public open letters um, that a prisoner writes to accompany their hunger strike. So in the case of uh, Samir Isawi, there are several letters he wrote that sort of autobiographical accounts of why he was in prison, why his imprisonment is unjust. Um, and those circulated in many different languages across social media um, and really made a difference in terms of shaping a kind of international perception of, um, of, of his experience and of the Palestinian prisoners experience. And I think you see a similar uh, phenomenon in Iran. I'm just gonna briefly read um, from a open letter um, by the uh, 
prisoner uh, who died uh, while on a hunger strike, uh, Iranian prisoner named uh, Shahrokh Zamani in tw uh, 2015. Um, he was a trade unionist and a uh, bus driver and he was imprisoned uh, simply because he supported workers' rights and he went on a hunger strike. He was in prison for many years. And, uh, but what's important I think about his, um, the, the way in which he positioned his activism in prison is that he really saw it as a kind of transnational enterprise. It wasn't, I mean, it, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't local. It was, it was in, in dialogue with the oppressive regimes around the world. So in the open letter that he wrote shortly before his death to sort of all of his, and he was, he was also very, by the way, just you'll see this in the letter, very strongly Marxist. And that was an important part of his, his conception of struggle. And I think you, you find that a lot in many of these prison hunger strikers. Um, it's just addressed to, to an international audience. Um, and so he thanks, he thanks every, uh, everyone for, his, for his support, compassion, and selfless assistance. So I'm just reading from his letter here. I'm trying to abbreviate it just so I get a sentence or two. Uh, he said, to, to, to quote the letter, um, it's, this is from the last paragraph. I suggest that with joint effort, centers of common organization of global and regional, especially in Turkey, the Arabic countries, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iran are formed to cooperate and conduct a program of sustained leading and in, in conscious uh, class struggle. Um, especially to assist us in creating national trade unions and workers' organizations to establish links with international organizations. And uh, he ends by saying, long live the internationalist unity of the workers of the world, the working class will be victorious. And this was written, I think, a few um, uh, months before he, he died of starvation. He was just allowed to starve um, in, in the Iranian prisons. And of course, that pattern of um, hunger striking has become even more important in the recent protests. There's the pictures were circulating of uh, a protester um, who was in prison named uh, Farhad Mesami, um, who again, uh, starved, uh, I mean, was allowed to reach the, reach the brink of starvation. Um, and it's interesting, you know, in terms of the comparative analysis, of course, some states are more willing to let themselves be portrayed as kind of brutal oppressors than others. So Iran's an example of a, a, a state that sort of um, seems, I guess, that doesn't, doesn't so much fear, you know, being seen as an oppressor, their, their prisoners do starve to death. Whereas say in, in the United States, um, the, 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 um, the very, I mean, force feeding, the, 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 there's, there's, there's a, an idea that, you know, um, prisoners prisoners shouldn't suffer or don't suffer of course that's not true but but there's a, a different threshold of tolerance for for the persecution of prisoners so so that means what that means is that uh, different types of hunger strikes uh, can be more effective in different contexts than others um and yeah so you see i think you could, as i said you can learn a lot about the kind of the the mentality or the techniques of the state um from from studying hunger strikes and uh, yeah, I think I think those are the the main points I wanted to make. Um, just that it, I think you'll come, you'll by reading the monograph, you know, you'll come away with a sense that although they are in prison, um, uh, hunger strikes show that the example of hunger strikes, the history of hunger strikes, um, have made a difference um, both in terms of prison conditions, but also in terms of the very causes that put prisoners in the prisons in the first place. Now, you know, they're not always successful, of course, like any struggle, but um, they show the power of people who are confined to their cells. Um, and uh, that's kind of remarkable achievement. So thanks so much for, for hopefully reading and listening. And I think I'm done. Is Bruce Sager. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, fascinating and a topic that is needs so much more exposition um, in the public sphere, right? And, and this book here is a, a remarkable um, first step toward a, a broader understanding of what that is. I wanna open the floor for our attendees to ask questions. If you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand and I can unmute you and you can introduce yourself and ask your question over the air, or you could type a question into the Q&A uh, box and we will read your question before our our presenters uh, will will tackle them. While you are, are collecting your thoughts and and writing questions, I'm going to start with a couple questions of my own uh, for the two of you to answer. And um, the first is I want to better understand um, when is it or why is it or how is it that uh, people who are incarcerated choose 
hunger striking as their tactic of choice? Uh, is uh, is it for normal specific ends or is it a range of things? And then as a second question, building off of that, what is the lever of change that they are pressing on when they choose this? What What is the mechanism? Um, Rebecca, do you want me to go ahead? Uh, I might add something, but you can go ahead. Yeah, you can start. Sure. Okay. Um, okay. Really brilliant questions. Thank you so much, Bruce. So um, really briefly, uh, when, why, and how prisoners um, kind of like embark on hunger strike um, and, and why, um, I think there's like one thing that I want to mention here, um, that it's not necessarily uh, their choice. Um, it's that they have no other option but to go into and embark on this you know act that can um cost them their lives uh which is something that we've seen in ireland in 1981 when 10 men died um, out of hunger strike uh, what i find really interesting in the israeli um case though um, and in the palestinian case is the fact that no prisoner actually um, died out of hunger strike it was uh, it was always force feeding that killed prisoners um, and the Israeli um, government and authorities always kind of point and, and paint that force feeding is there to protect you. Um, but the reality is force feeding is there and it has killed you before. Um, but the other thing that is so important to mention in the second question that you've asked, which is again, a brilliant question, uh, what they um, kind of rely on um, when it comes to their action. Uh, there are so many things to mention here, but one of which is the solidarity action that exists outside the prison. Transnational solidarity uh, from an uh, activism from um, other contexts around the world is also quite important. Their family is central uh, to their action. Um, the, the lawyer, like that contact with the outside world is quite important for them. Um, and yeah, I mean, legal action more particularly as well can be helpful in some context, uh, but that what comes to my mind, I'm sure Rebecca has other questions and I can see that there are other questions in the chat as well. Uh, yeah, I can briefly respond as well. I think Malika gave a comprehensive answer, uh, but I would just say, I think, you know, as much as you can um, compare these, as much as there's commonality among different prison strikers, I think that question about motivation and demands is where you see the starkest differences. I think in sort of context of say Israeli prisons, I mean, which is one we focused on a lot, they're asking for things like vegetation rights. You know, there are very concrete demands about prison conditions. Um, in the Iranian case, uh, from what I've seen, I think because as my, I think my examples illustrated, there's, there's less hope of like a concrete success. I mean, the prisoners who go on strike are likely to die in many cases. So in a sense, their demands are, are very large, like just to quote the the, the demand, I'm quoting from a, um, a letter written by uh, Farhad Mesami, who I think it was just a few weeks ago died um, in prison. And he's and he really, he starved to death. I mean, you could see from pictures what happened. And he says, um, I will still insist on my three demands of stopping the execution of protesters, releasing six political prisoners, prisoners and stopping mandatory hijab. And that didn't happen, but I think you know he made a very, very powerful statement that will have an impact over the long term. So there's there's just an incredible variation. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. It's fascinating to me the the idea of of being pushed to do something that you don't have a choice of, uh, and yet that action can be seen as maybe right. the ultimate act of agency, mm -hmm. right? claiming claiming ownership over your own body and your own life. I see we have a raised hand from John Johns. John, I'm going to. Um, Paul on you, would you take a moment to introduce yourself and then ask your question? Uh, hi, uh, good afternoon or good morning. Actually, I'm in I'm in Arizona, so we're still on West Coast time. I um, um I had a question. I've been a longtime member of Amnesty International, and I actually wrote a question, so it's in the chat box. But um, they have always relied, or they're they're the essence of that organization. The culture of the organization is letter writing. Uh, on behalf of political prisoners, um, prisoners of conscience. And so I think they call it the mobilization of shame. So my question is, this is, your presentation is really illuminating. It's uh, it's uh, it's really new for me. Um, I was very familiar, I'm, I'm relatively familiar with the Irish hunger strikes with Bobby Sands. Um, and and so the, the amnesty point of view would be 
you write letters to the prison officials or you write letters to Margaret Thatcher and then she's moved to make a, a change. No, nothing would move Margaret Thatcher, you know, humanity or compassion. But my question is, is that concept of the mobilization of shame, does it now come in conflict with the idea of agency for um, for prisoners, for, you know, prisoners, you know, you know, prisoners of conscience making a, a, a really critical statement? Uh, Rebecca, do you want to go first this time or should I go first? That's a really complicated question. Yeah, I think if, if you have some uh, response, I'd, I'd sort of meditate on it a bit or yeah. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think this is a this is a really good question. Thank you so much, John. Um, there are so many things that come to my mind, one of which is that there are different types of prisons. Uh, so there are authoritarian prisons, colonial prisons, etc. And I think the way that we should deal with all prisons are similar, but not necessarily the same, not identical. Um, if we if we're dealing with colonial prisons, for example, it's hard to like send a letter to the prison authorities and expect that they can respond positively about a hunger striker who is part of the colonized uh, population in that uh, in in that region. So I think letters can be helpful, uh, but not in all instances that can come to my mind now. Um, I think we need to make sure that power structures and power dynamics are pushed to be kind of like, we like we need to, to flatten that power structure that exists in the world. And I think this is what we need to kind of push for. Um, and letter is part of that, but I don't think that it's necessarily very helpful. Um, and I think this is not only about amnesty, it's about other international organizations that are working to support prisoners and hunger strikes and activists um, around the world, the kind of language that they usually use. I mean, one of the things that we, we use in, in the monograph um, is the language of resilience, you know, expecting prisoners or, or people going through struggles and um, an injustice to kind of cope with this injustice instead of tackling the root causes that actually force them to be resilient. Um, so that language can be very dehumanizing because it strips the person of their the, of their basic human um, human aspects of life, including vulnerability and you know fragility. Just going there to cry in the corner of their bedroom when they want to, right? Um, so that is also important and, and, and part of the human characteristic of any individual in the world that we live in, and that should be embraced, I guess. Can I follow up? Not not with a question, but with a comment. It that seems. Um, how do I put that? It's it's. I don't want to say it's counterintuitive, but I think it's. Um, it's an important thing that that we on the outside need to take into consideration. Uh, should we show solidarity? And I think it's almost like we need an instruction manual on how to do it. Because as I, if I hear you right, you can you can really undermine the uh, prisoner's uh, goal, the prisoner's agency, and and with good intentions. Mm. That's very good food for thought. I, and I can just add, uh, just sort of add a little bit to what Malika is saying. I mean, I think the other limitation of a lot of these letter writing campaigns is that they don't, there is a tendency to, I think, focused on say celebrities or certain certain prisoners who have more visibility, like in the Iranian context, I mean, dual nationals, for example, people who, who have some connection with America or the United States tend to get a lot more coverage and even by probably by organizations such as Amnesty than say obscure, um, I don't know, factory workers, you know, who may not even speak English. And so I think that's also a big, a big limitation that international campaigns need to overcome is not just focusing on the, the celebrity prisoners. Mm, yes, very wise. We have a, a typed question from one attendee. Uh, Said writes, uh, what challenges and data collection did you face in, in doing this research? Uh, yeah, Rebecca, or should I go ahead? Uh, so, so just what, repeat the, the question one more time. What challenges? Oh, yeah. yeah, the challenges uh, specifically with data collection that you faced. Well, I think Malika kind of covered the the, the challenges of um, accessing participants. I think there's also, a, I mean, the, perhaps even the most important question is sort of 
safety uh, for, 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 for people and speakers, not just accessing, but you know, when they give, many prisoners are happy to speak, but sometimes they are putting themselves or ex-prisoners could be putting themselves at risk or their family at risk. And so they are taking a risk just by speaking and, and how to kind of um, protect them and, and honor, if they do choose to put themselves at risk, how do you honor that risk? And, and uh, so I think there's like the human, yeah, that, that human aspect probably is the most difficult. Um, well, also, I mean, I think as, as we, I mentioned, Briefly, a big part of our research is to do with letters, and, and some of some of these letters were like uh, written on um, uh, scraps of, say, cigarette paper, toilet paper. Um, what, what the ways that the strikes were organized? Now, obviously, you know, a lot of that's lost. So that, that that's another kind of um, archival problem, right? The actual evidence, uh, in many cases, isn't uh, extant. But Malika, do you have more? I'm sure. I think. I think what Rebecca mentioned is very important. The other thing that I want to mention is the kind of perception that, that, that people have of you as a Palestinian doing this research on Palestinian prisoners. And there's always the objectivity uh, question that comes to the surface, like how can you be a Palestinian and working on Palestinian prisoners? Um, are you objective? How do you actually kind of detach yourself from this from the subject, um, and this is not something that I often get as a Palestinian working on Palestinian prisoners, but also working on Palestine sometimes, um, there is always a question of objectivity, which is sad to see in the academia, but sadly exists. And then you see the other, uh, like you see, I don't know, someone who's not Palestinian or someone from the global north, uh, a white uh, middle class man uh, having the access and the privilege to visit Palestine whenever they want and do research for, I don't know, a couple of weeks or a couple of months and come out being expert, being given that platform to speak uh, about Palestine uh, because they, ha they have been there. Um, well, of course, as, as a Palestinian or as Palestinian academics or as academics uh, often from the global south, they don't have that privilege. Um, so I think, yeah, that's also one of the challenges um, that comes to my mind. Mm, that's very insightful. And I think there's a lot to be said there about cultural differences in, in what knowledge is and how it's constituted and whether it's rooted in externality or the internal experience. So I appreciate your thoughts on that. We have uh, many other written questions. Linda writes, uh, I, would like more I would like more discussion about the non-binary nature of violence, non-violence. Do you want to begin? Uh, tell, me, tell me how. Tell me how you two see it. I, and I know you know in, yeah. in the early chapter chapters of your book you discuss mm -hmm. um, sort of theoretical framing and you engage with this idea. So uh, please mm. please explain your 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 understanding of this. I I can I can kind of like very briefly um, say that um, the idea of this binary viewpoint itself I as as a Palestinian myself, I feel, and as someone who spoke with a number of uh, prisoners, not only in Palestine, but also outside Palestine, there is the understanding uh, from my interviewees that this kind of viewpoint has roots in the colonialist narrative of violence kind of being equated with barbarism and nonviolence being equated with a passive role on the part of the oppressed. Um, and in the monograph, we said that this kind of passive role dehumanized the hunger strikers because hunger strikers, we think, are not passive, but they are active participants. Um, when a hunger strike is conducted, uh, of course, it's so important to keep in mind, like all other organized and active political uh, protests, uh, hunger strikes uh, or hunger strikers have political objectives that they want to achieve, power structure that they want to challenge and alternative ones that they want to create. Um, so this binary does dehumanize, I think, uh, the roles of hunger strikers. I think Rebecca may also have other thoughts on here, um, but this is what comes to my mind uh, in response to the question. Yeah, I think we, we had quite a, a, even years of really interesting discussions on this topic. I mean, it was really a productive question. I think the, the, the definition of violence. I mean, I think the first thing to say is just like, that's it's relative, right? What is violent? You know, if, if you're in prison, and a state is like chaining you to a wall, whatever it is, I mean, or even just forcing you inside a, a cell, that's an act of violence as well, right? And so um, in the state usually class, even in terms of classical political theory defines violence, right? So um, 
it's it's not a kind of um, neutral situation. Um, and yeah, so so that's why the kind of the, the non the, the state also the, the organizations, the entities that imprison people often, often there's a pattern of sort of denying that they can be political prisoners, right? So in the Israeli context, they wouldn't say that um, someone who, who goes to jail for, for, yeah, protesting against the Israeli occupation is not called a political prisoner because that's already an admission, you know, that, that there's some, some kind of injustice at work. Same thing in the Iranian context, same thing, you know, in the context of apartheid in South Africa. It's, it's a very common phenomenon. So, so I think we need to think about, you know, who has the power to, to, to make these categories, to create these definitions. And hunger striking is an example of, of uh, a prisoner kind of asserting power. Um, but yeah, in a way that, that overcomes that, that binary between violence and nonviolence. Thank you. We also have a question from John Pascalides in the, in the submissions. John writes, thanks for the talk. Could you elaborate on how the nature of hunger strikes, for example, their efficacy differs depending on whether they are undertaken inside prison or outside prison? That's a very good question. I didn't think about this before. Um, Rebecca, do you want to go first? Uh, I'm trying to <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's, it's important and also challenging. Um, I think maybe the most powerful hunger strikes are those that are both, right? In other words, collective hunger strikes involving people in prison and, out, and outside of prison in solidarity with hunger strikers within. Um, often, yeah, the, the hunger strikers within prison are probably going to be better attuned to what prisoners need, what, you know, what the actual demands are on the ground. And so they can mobilize in that context more effectively. But again, every, every hunger strike really, I think you can categorically say is a kind of message to the world. So when there's prison hunger strikes outside as well, that makes it more powerful. Uh, yeah, that, those are, that's the example that occurs to me that, that the ones that are both are the, are the most effective. Yeah, and I'm also thinking in terms of access, uh, it's possible that people embarking on hunger strike outside the prison context are gonna have more access to solidarity and support and activism, uh, while prisoners um, are not necessarily gonna have the same kind of privilege of access. Um, mostly, of course, because the structure that is the prison is set to cut prisoners from the rest of the world um, and cut their connection and communication with, with the outside world. So I assume um, from the research that we've done um, that prison hunger strikes are going to be harder, more dangerous, um, and not necessarily as accessible, um, especially when there are different and a large number of prisoners actually going for hunger strike. Uh, it becomes much harder for the outside community to know who is striking, what, why they're striking for, or what they're striking for, um, and, and all such questions become much harder. I see Steve also has a question. Yes, I wanted to call on Steve next. Steve uh, Chase will play the significant role in this publication and we're so glad you're here steve i'm going to uh, ask you to unmute and please share your question with us great uh, this is so exciting to to see the fruition of this and to have this published so just kudos to to you all i'm wondering i have not read the latest version so i'm wondering what yeah. sort of lessons towards the end that you have of, of what are things that would increase the effectiveness from prisoners doing hunger strikes and how they approach it, as well as external solidarity forces? Did you, in, in talking with all these folks, did you start getting a sense of, oh, this increases the effectiveness and power um, of this kind of activity for justice. Rebecca, do you want to go first? Um, okay, yeah, I mean, I, I, I could point you, so we, I'm looking at the pages here, uh, page uh, 95, 96, so towards the end, yeah, we do have a section for uh, uh, so active uh, activists in solidarity with with prison hunger strikers and i think to go back to the earlier question too from the uh, member of amnesty international 
I guess it's, you know, maybe it's not so much about influencing political leaders um, who often aren't necessarily interested in, in, in justice, but about engaging the media. That's that's kind of the recurrent theme. And that's, I think, what so they do want their message spread. You know, they do want their open letters of prison hunger strikers. I mean, they do want them circulated as widely as possible, translated into as many languages and just to have an impact. Um, and and the, the most effective channels are not necessarily going to be sort of the ruling political party of the day, but but the media and increasingly right the media um, can affect political outcomes, and that that includes the particular social media I think which we found is just like incredibly Facebook and Twitter especially um, you know not always but but yeah that that's that's the really I think accessible um, way of, of making a difference. Um, framing and, and yeah changing the narrative you know um so so often the um media may tend to call you know the sort of reflexive tendency to to think of palestinian prisoners as somehow violent in some kind of way and and actually you know they're often political prisoners and and you know sometimes just by not having the right id they can be classified as criminals but well you know but i think if you think about those narratives more carefully um using the the messages from prison strikers you know then it, there's a role for scope for changing the media narrative so i think that's probably the number one thing um yeah that stood out yeah i think rebecca summarized things very um clearly um i would maybe like add a few more points one of which is um like the way that we frame hunger strikers and prisoners, um, I think it's so important to humanize their experience. Um, like I've mentioned before, that kind of resilient narrative, for example, and expecting prisoners in specific part of the world um, to embark on hunger strikes and be fine uh, past 100 days um, is not necessarily um, a good way forward and it's very dehumanizing. Um, so humanizing their experiences, I think very important. Um, solidarity is very important as well, not only from their family and you know group uh, like neighbors and, and, and such, uh, but also from outside uh, their countries. So transnational solidarity and activism is quite important and central to the efficiency, to the, you know, like the effectiveness of, of hunger strikes um, and the effectiveness of prison resistance as well. Media, of course, including social media, like uh, Rebecca rightly mentioned, is uh, quite important, especially that it allows you um, to, of course, write in different languages. Um, but yeah, I guess the bottom line is, is to um, challenge the structure of prisons uh, because they are violent spaces. Um, and they, the way they understand prisons is not only as spaces of, of, uh, of power, but also of resistance. Uh, they are spaces of power because they are there um, not only to torture and punish prisoners, uh, and, and many of those are, especially when we speak about colonial uh, prisons, they are oppressed, colonized populations. Uh, but the system and the structure itself is violent and how it pushes a uh, prisoner to the margin and connect and disconnect and uh, them disconnect them from, from the rest of the world. But they're also spaces of resistance uh, where prisoners, of course, resist uh, this structure and, and this system and try everything that they can do that they can have and they can do uh, to resist uh, such structure um but yeah that's what comes to my mind thank you both we are near the end of our time so we'll have to cut the discussion off here even though we have raised hands and more questions i want to oh. invite participants um, if you have questions that have not been answered please email us i'll be happy to share them with Rebecca and Malika. And if you uh, wouldn't mind writing some short answers that we could post on the webinar page um, so that we can keep this discussion going just a little bit longer. We're so grateful that you have written this book and that you've done this research and that you have shared um, some of the key things with us today. I've learned a lot from the two of you over the last couple of years working on this project. And again, uh, sitting in this virtual space with you. So thank you so much for what you've contrib contributed to, to this world. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a real gift, and we're grateful for it. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thanks to the ICNC as well, and thanks to everyone who attended today. I hope that you have uh, a great day ahead as well. I want everyone to know that you can download this PDF uh, for free from ICNC's web page. You can find it. Um, at nonviolent-conflict.org, and you can also purchase hard copies from bookshop.org. 
And here's the email address if you want to write us any follow-up questions, webinar at nonviolent-conflict.org. And you can access the recording of the webinar, and you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at those links. Again, we're so grateful to both of you, and I encourage everyone to, to follow up this webinar with downloading a copy to really dig deep into this. It really goes um, on a granular level into what the process of a hunger strike looks like uh, from beginning to end. And I think that, it, that alone, even without all the other parts of the book, is such a contribution to, to an understanding for those of us who have not been incarcerated or have had family members incarcerated to have any sort of window into this or foothold into understanding it. So thank you so much for your great contribution. And we look forward to, to learning more from you in the years to come in all of your academia and research. Thank you to our participants for joining. We're happy that you're here today. Have a good evening.